Welcome to the last session of TQC. This is session B. And we start with the first talk, which is from Tiago from UC Berkeley, who tells us about uh, a new approximation algorithm for local Hamiltonians. So go ahead, Tiago. Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, approximation algorithms for local Hamiltonians. So to begin and make sure everyone's on the same page, I wanted to revisit uh, my favorite QMA complete problem, which is the local Hamiltonian problem. So here we're given some Hermitian atrix H, which is defined as a sum of local terms. And the task is to decide whether the minimum eigenvalue of H is below some value A or larger than some value B. And by local, I simply mean that this matrix is implicitly defined on some hypergraph G on uh, N edges and uh, sorry, n vertices, which are the qubits, and e edges. And each summoned in this matrix uh, factorizes as a tensor product, where it only acts as non-trivially or not as identity on the edge itself, on each edge itself. And this task, it's QMA hard in general, following seminal work by Kataev and others, up to some additive error, inverse polynomial additive error. And it's hard even on very simple and structured graphs, like 1D chains or planar graphs. Um, but in the absence of a PCP theorem or just a generic theory of hardness of approximation, not really much can be said about a larger error or different types of uh, hypergraphs. And so the question that we're going to try to study in this talk is when we can classically approximate these gra the, the ground state energy. And so if you were to ask a physicist or a, or a chemist, they'll immediately tell you that the mean field approximation is a, a valuable heuristic to approximate these systems in practice. And essentially what it amounts to is to search over product states instead of entangled states as your approximation to your ground state. And so what that means is that you're essentially, your ansatz is a, a tensor product of these smaller vectors, each one in, in C2, which are these single qubit states. Um, since these, these individual vectors have a succinct description, they're just two entry vectors, the task is in NP, but it might still be NP hard to solve. That is, to find the best product state might be a computationally intensive task. And so in, on that note, it's hard even to provide rigorous evidence that the mean field method works well. So the starting point in, of this work is this beautiful result by Brandau and Harrow on, on product state approximations to, to local Hamiltonians. And so what they showed is that local Hamiltonians defined on sufficiently dense regular graphs have good product state approximations in the sense that the product state approximates the energy of the global ground state up to some factor which decays at the degree. And so they combine these like information theoretic ideas with existing approximation schemes for, for finding the best product state of, uh, of dense graphs, low threshold rank graphs, and other types of pl uh, and planar graphs to develop polynomial time approximation schemes to compute their ground state energies. However, oftentimes came at a runtime, which was a, a bit obscene in terms of the, the additive error desired. Um, but these techniques, they prove to be very versatile, and they're still used in a lot of recent work for hardness of approximation for the, the quantum Mexico problem, following work by Huang and uh, John Wright and others, and uh, approximation algorithms for the free energy, following work by Sergey Bravi and, and others. And well, we'll try to discuss uh, the, the main contribution in this work is kind of threefold. The first are improved product state approximations uh, and extensions to these statements by Brenda and Harrow to the free energy. The second are new combinatorial decompositions for local Hamiltonians. And the third are applications of the previous two to develop approximation schemes. And in the interest of time, uh, I'll try to focus on the latter two points in this talk, although I do think the, the information theoretic results are interesting in their own way. Right. 
So our main algorithmic result is, and our main algorithm is relatively simple to state. So I'll try to state it up front and spend the rest of the talk motivating the proof techniques behind it. The, the main, or our main result, is in fact a constant time algorithm, uh, additive error approximation algorithm for Hamiltonians defined on dense graphs. And, see, the, and so the algorithm, it basically works as follows. We're given some two local Hamiltonian, which is defined on some number of vertices and, and edges, and we're gonna subsample a constant number of those vertices, uh, where the constant depends on the, the desired accuracy. And we're going to let HQ be the so-called induced Hamiltonian on all the edges which are con entirely contained in that subset Q. Then we're going to compute either exactly or approximately the ground state energy of HQ. And we're going to scale it up by the number of vertices that we subsample. So that's this factor of N squared over Q squared. And the key claim is that with constant probability, over the choice of the subsample, this estimate is a good estimate, or is an accurate estimate for the ground state energy of the global system. So perhaps I'll leave a moment to, to absorb the statement. Cool. So, our algorithm is inspired by a long line of work on approximations to max cut on dense graphs. But to formulate what that means, uh, I'll need to take a second to define some notation. So we're, we're going to oftentimes talk about cut matrices. And cut matrices given two subsets are essentially the adjacency matrix of a complete bipartite graph between those two subsets. So this beautiful result by Friesen Cannon in 99 which they referred to as a weak matrix regularity lemma, essentially stipulates that any matrix, any real matrix, can be decomposed into a linear combination of these cut matrices, where the number of terms in this decomposition only depends on the desired error in the decomposition. And it only depends on the desired error. And the desired error itself is measured in this infinity to one norm, which they refer to as a cut norm, and intuitively, what really this is saying is that uh, dense graphs can be viewed as a sum of complete bipartite graphs. And the error in the decomposition is essentially the difference in cut weight between the two graphs. So in a sense, you know, if your goal is to approximate the max cut, you can approximate the max cut on this cut decomposition, on this sum of complete bipartite graphs, and it will be a good approximation to the max cut on your original graph. Here, it's important to point out that the error uh, scales with n squared. Um, and so in particular, it's only really a reasonable approximation when the graph is dense to begin with. Um, so uh, their, their results are essentially an algorithmic version of Zimmer Eddy's celebrated regularity lemma and was, has since been applied to, to develop, uh, as I said, approximations to Maxica on dense and low threshold rank graphs, following the original work by Friesen Cannon and uh, extensions by Alan, De Vega, Karpinski, and Cannon, as well as Garan, more recently by Garan and Trevisan. So unsurprisingly, the main technical contribution in this work is a Hamiltonian version of this regularity lemma. So essentially what it stipulates, uh, again, to, be, to begin by setting up some notation, given two subsets and, of the vertices in the graph and two Pauli operators, we refer to a complete bipartite Hamiltonian as the two local Hamiltonian, which is the Pauli P on the subsets in S and the Pauli Q on the subsets in T. So our Hamiltonian regularity lemma, what it says is that any two local Hamiltonian can, de can be decomposed into a linear combination of these complete bipartite Hamiltonians, where the error as measured in spectral norm, um, or where the number of terms in the decomposition only depends on the desired error, which 
now is measured in spectral norm. So in particular, this implies that the ground state energy of H is close to the ground state energy of the decomposition up to this scaling factor. Now, to, to give some idea for where this comes from, basically, it comes from a multicolored version of the matrix regularity lemma, where we apply it to each graph defined by a Pauli basis decomposition of the Hamiltonian. So in particular, we decompose the Hamiltonian into local terms, of where we fix, say, Pauli x and Pauli y, and we consider the n by n matrix uh, j i j, um, which are the coefficients of these Pauli terms on each edge. We apply the cut decomposition to each one of these coefficient matrices and group up the terms again to define the cut decomposition. Now, to give some words, uh, to give some intuition behind our proof techniques, we, which kind of, and we kind of follow the same inspiration throughout uh, other, other proofs in, in this work, the basic idea is to begin using product state approximations. So essentially say that the error in spectral norm is close to the energy difference between the two Hamiltonians, but only over product states. Then the triangle inequality tells us that this energy difference is upper bounded by the error in each, in each choice of basis in the Pauli basis decomposition, which just, which individually happen to be the cut norm itself which is bounded via uh, the matrix regularity results. So now, why does this give us faster algorithms? The basic idea is that it, it, it enables convex relaxations to the ground state energy. So to, to illustrate this point with just a single example, consider just a single bipartite Hamiltonian H of S T for subsets S and T, where we apply the poly X over S and the Pauli y over t. Then for any product state, the energy of that product state on this Hamiltonian is simply a product of these linear forms, which you may recognize as the average x magnetization on S and the average y magnetization of the product state on the subset t. The catch is that what if we were to guess these magnetizations? by introducing parameters r and c between minus n and n, and introducing some slack parameter gamma. Then there's a well-defined set of affine constraints, oh, sorry, this should be psi, on the product state psi, which constrains this magnetization to lie between a radius of r and c. And the key idea is that any product state which is feasible for these constraints has energy near the product of r and c. And moreover, really there's no difference between any two product states on the same size of the cut. So if psi A and psi B are both in S, you might as well take them to be the same. So our original, original set of constraint, uh, uh, original set, you know, our original SDP, which was defined on N variables, can essentially be collapsed into an SDP on just two variables, one for each of these subsets. And in particular, this essentially gives us an algorithm to approximate the ground state energy by checking the feasibility of a bunch of different SDPs, one for each choice of guess, R and C, in, this, in some discretization of the range from minus N to N. Now, I already find um, this relaxation pretty uh, pretty fascinating, and the the fact that you can collapse the 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 approximation algorithm to a constant size uh, SDP already proved to have like proves proves to have a number of applications to developing approximation algorithms. However, it essentially requires an exponential number of queries to the Hamiltonian, uh, where here exponential in in the desired error. Uh, the, it's still in the N independent. And the question that Alan and others tried to study is whether you can do better. They, in a sense, what is the sample complexity to your, dis your description of uh, a formula of, or some Hamiltonian of max KCSPs? And our main result, uh, 
previously stated in the algorithmic description, is essentially such a vertex sample complexity statement, but for local Hamiltonians. And uh, restating, we essentially need a one over epsilon to the sixth number of samples to the qubits of H to be able to estimate its ground state energy up to some uh, dense factor. So again, sorry, here should be n squared. Um, I was planning on saying a few words about this proof technique, but perhaps in the interest of time, I'll just try to focus on the, the open problems that I'd like to try to discuss in this line. So perhaps the main question on this line is whether there's a systematic way to do any better than product states. So perhaps uh, what about the so promising uh, attempts in this line have been uh, low depth circuit rounding following work by Anshu et al, uh, Robbie King and, and Lee, or perhaps even perturbative expansions following work by recent work by Hastings. A question that I particularly like is about uh, refutations to the ground state energy. So the notion of a refutation is essentially an algorithm which can certify or prove a lower bound to the ground state energy uh, to prove that, say, like a frustration, uh, a, a, if your task is to decide between, say, a, a frustration-free Hamiltonian or a Hamiltonian who's whose energy is strictly bounded above zero, a refutation algorithm is essentially a proof that it's that this Hamiltonian is not frustration free. Um, and recent work by Hastings and O'Donnell has made certain progress in, on this line for the for the SYK model. And more generally, what can be said about average case hardness of local Hamiltonians? That's outside the the super dense and sparse regimes. Um, where we already know that the problem is either uh, frustration-free with high probability um, uh, or, or with high probability or frustrated or unsatisfiable. Uh, that's all I had, and thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, Tiago. Um, not sure how, how it works now exactly. So are there any questions that does people have possibility to unmute themselves or is there a micro or somebody where we can ask questions for Tiago? If I uh, stop screen sharing, I could monitor the Discord too, but. Ah, I, I monitor the Discord, I think it was quiet. Otherwise I have the wrong. The wrong channel. Maybe to get it started, I can ask a question. Maybe it's a naive one, but I was also wondering. So, um, basically, the question that you stated in the in the last slide in the open question. So, did people consider um, other other um, approaches than product state approximations? For example, in like in in, in information theory, um, sometimes convex combination of product states. Are, are, are very useful and are considerably much more powerful than only product states because there's something called the Definetti theorem, which tells us roughly that if you have a permutation invariant state, then you can write it as a convex combination of product states. So I was wondering, did, and, and since you do relaxations, maybe you can deal with the convex combination. Did people think about something like this or not? Um. Yeah, so that's a great idea. So in particular, these these information theoretic results by Brenda and Harrow, they're they're yes. inspired by Diffinetti theorems. Yes, right. Um, and uh, in effect, like what it's saying is that you know there exists a separable state which, on local marginals, uh, is close to like the marginal of the ground state. Mm -hmm. um, and you could consider attempting to to optimize the ground state energy over separable states which i believe is what you mean by like a convex combination of yes. of product states but you know by an averaging argument there always exists if a separable state has low energy there always exists a product state with low energy okay um so if you had a classical algorithm which could enumerate over uh, product states or just optimize and find the best product state to some extent then Im implicitly, it's also finding the 
the best separable state. Okay. Um, but you're right in the sense that perhaps there is an algorithm which could leverage the structure of a separable state instead of uh, instead of a product state. And yeah. a priori, I don't know. Okay. Cool. Um, so okay, maybe I'm on the wrong Discord um, link, but okay, I cannot see any questions on Discord, and it doesn't seem like other people have the chance to ask questions. Otherwise, now it's the time to unmute yourself or, or grab a micro and ask Tiago questions. So next, try. Okay, if, if not, I think we, we, we thank Tiago and then we do 10 minutes break before we start the next talk. Thanks, Tiago, for the talk.